thank you for those of us who are joining us, uh, wherever it is, whether it's uh, your morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Block Asset Management, the world's first digital asset and blockchain fund of funds, and Lehman Bush, the Asian investment arm of the Bush family. And we're also Block Asset Management's official Asia partner. And we are delighted to bring to you the leading names in digital asset funds, debating how best to invest in digital assets. But please be advised, we will not be talking about what blockchain and Bitcoin are tonight. We will not be talking about where prices are going or where the industry will be in five years. Instead, this event is meant to address the hard questions about investing in digital assets that you have as an institutional investor. And to those questions, ladies and gentlemen, a panel of crypto hedge fund stars whose reputation precedes them. Joining us is Dan Moorhead. Dan was a Goldman Sachs trader and global head of FX options at Deutsche Bank before founding his own FX platform and then founding Pantera in 2013. Pantera is America's first Bitcoin investment firm and is undoubtedly the most recognized fund in the space, returning billions to its investors. Welcome, Dan, good to have you. Uh, also with us is Desiree Muller, a former portfolio manager at Credit Suisse. Desiree is the CEO of Swiss Rex AG, whose fund is one of the industry's best kept secrets, consistently outperforming most of funds and driven by research the valuable product in its own right. Thanks for joining us, Desiree. Uh, also joining us is Jeff Dorman, CIO of ARCA Funds. In addition to two decades of portfolio management, he's also served as COO of major fintech firm Harvest Exchange. His widely read blog, That's Our Two Satoshis, demonstrates his unparalleled understanding of both the macro and micro events driving the digital asset industry and market. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, next, we have a veteran derivatives and options trader for the likes of Paribus and Deutsche Bank. He went on to found the award-winning multi-billion dollar asset management group, Trafalgar. Now founder of the Altana Wealth Fund, he's sought after as both a writer and speaker on digital asset investment. Welcome to you, Mr. Lee Robinson. Also with us is Kyle Samani, a software engineer whose skill and dedication led him to found and serve as CEO of a smart glasses venture that was acquired in 2017. His deep technical understanding of blockchain plays a critical role in the success of Multicoin, which is known for pioneering token economic models and valuation methodologies. Thanks for joining us, Kyle. Ultimately, we hope we have with us Brian Kelly, an investor. He's the author of the Bitcoin Big Bang and a sought after commentator. Brian is also a successful serial investment firm entrepreneur. His latest venture, BKCM, offers a flagship fund that actively manages a portfolio of digital currencies. So welcome, Brian, if you're joining us. Uh, I'm your moderator, Ernie Diaz from Lehman Bush, and I'm also joined by moderator Kevin Ballard and our host, Manuel De Luque Montaner of Block Asset Management. So it's time to start. And a reminder first to all, we won't be presenting the funds themselves, but rather how their manager's strategies and insights may or may not align with your goals. Of course, more information on all these great funds will be made available following our Q&A. But first, we're going to break this panel into three phases. First is diversifying into crypto assets, its challenges. Second, whether or how to diversify into that fund that's right for you. And third, we'll finally be debating on whether investing in a fund of funds is the ultimate diversification. So for phase one, we're here because we believe we need exposure to digital assets. But that in itself brings up a lot of questions and challenges, as I'm sure our panel will, will agree. So for our first question, it's one we run into a lot, is shouldn't we just invest in Bitcoin? I mean, it's comparable to the Amazon or Google, say, of cryptocurrency. So we can assume that it's safe for the long term. And all these lesser known cryptos could very possibly die a MySpace or a shop.com death. So uh, to be polite and ladies first, Desiree, could you let us know what you think, what you would say to uh, an institutional investor who's thinking, you know, maybe I'll just um, go long Bitcoin. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to be on the call. Um, yeah, as you say, I also think Bitcoin is already comparable to the Amazons and Googles of this world. It already has a big brand and a large market capitalization. But I personally would have loved to buy Google when the valuation was still below 1 million around the year 2000. 
And that's also the project I'm trying to find in the crypto space. The hidden gems in the back rows on a place 30, 40, 50 in terms of market capitalization, but with good fun fundamentals and uh, business models, that's the ones I want to have in my portfolio. But in the end, as you say, it's a young industry. Many of the 5,000 tokens that are currently being traded on exchanges will die. And that's why I believe in active management. Ah, uh, good point. And uh, Lee, as, as we've noted on your, on your site, and as you said, the majority of your fund's value is currently derived from the price movement of Bitcoin. So we, are you a little more pro Bitcoin and of course not all chips on, but what's, what's your view on that question of just um, weighting heavily towards Bitcoin, say whether you're active or passive? Well, we're, we're heavily weighted towards Bitcoin at the moment, but that can change. And from our point of view, the crypto space is still relatively young, right? It's 10 years old, just over 10 years old. So the winner could well be and probably will be something else other than Bitcoin and something else will come, uh, come out there. There is such a, a demand for, uh, you know, peer to peer currency. It's going to be worth trillions of dollars that somebody is going to work on something that is better than Bitcoin and eventually there, the prize is so big that it's not going to be ignored. And, you know, you seem to think, seem to forget that this is a, uh, this is not a re relatively speaking quite small currency compared to say gold or compared to silver or compared to uh, you know, the Mexican peso or something like that. So we definitely think that you should be um, cognizant of the fact that somebody else will come in. And that's why sadly in this space, you need to go to a third party manager and uh, seek their advice. I want to follow up on why you said sadly, but to keep it with Bitcoin, because you said something intriguingly and great point about the um, relatively small uh, market cap value of Bitcoin in its own right. Are you hinting that it could be a MySpace? Do you have uh, other, you know, coins that you have more faith in? I, I wouldn't imagine it's Ether. You know, the, the, all that talk of the flippening was a good three years ago, if I remember correctly. Well, look, look, you pay you pay a manager for many things, but one of the things a manager does is provide a service and provides custody, provides the ability to give you uh, insight, but also uh, to pick the winners. And you know, Amazon could have fallen by the wayside, and Google could have been out. Could have been beaten by Yahoo. Who knows? But mm. uh, the point is here: we are, you know, we are the moment of the view that Bitcoin is the winner and has been for a number of years. But we are open-minded to the fact that over time something else will come along. And the nice thing about digital currencies are that they're very, they're, they're very transparent. They're very easy to find. And uh, if if one of them is suddenly going from number one thousand to number ten in market capitalization, um, you know, we're going to notice it and we're going to think very hard about switching. And we, you know, we were involved quite heavily uh, in Litecoin uh, in 14 and 15 at the very beginning. And of course, you know, no one talks about it anymore. And the technology behind Litecoin was, was, was excellent uh, and arguably in some ways uh, better than Ethereum. But of course, you know, the trends change. So, you know, we're open minded, but you know, this is why you pay a manager. He's meant to be looking and protecting your back and making sure that he changes from Bitcoin to something else. I appreciate you, Lee. Thanks for that. I mean, yes, in this phase, we're kind of trying to explore about the challenges of just exposing our portfolios to digital assets. I know you've got some great points to make about how to um, diversify with a fund and the benefits of that kind of active management. But let me move to a second question, please, because this is an important one. Yes, everybody, uh, so many people don't even know the difference between Bitcoin and blockchain. It may surprise some potential investors that there's far more to the investable digital asset universe than Bitcoin and even other cryptocurrencies. Uh, there are quite a few sectors of this ecosystem. So I'd like to ask uh, Kyle, which do you find most compelling? Uh, if we can put this in terms of reducing risk through diversified investing, because ladies and gentlemen, you should know that Multicoin is quite visionary. You know, they invest in, in all sorts of even startup blockchain companies. So I'm kind of throwing you a curveball, Kyle. Uh, can you tell us about some of the other sectors available, but which ones uh, you find compelling as, from an institutional investor standpoint who's in, in, interested in, you know, uh, diversification as risk management? Sure. So the way we think about crypto is, um, what, what does this kind of core technology do? The internet was a new way to send information around. And in 1994, it was kind of hard to understand what, like, what, what is the information arbitrage gap 
Like, and, and how do you make information travel more efficiently? And that was a very abstract, right? Thinking and people don't understand what that is. When I look at crypto, the crypto is really about reducing trust for people to engage in financial contracts um, or technical contracts of sorts. Um, and so we wrote an essay a little more than a year ago. Um, we call what we call the crypto mega theses that like encapsulated our kind of four, I've been in this space now kind of four years full time and three years professionally, um, taking all of that kind of thinking and, and, and distilling it into three core theses, all of which are, are fundamentally about reducing trust between parties that engage in some contract. Um, and the first of those theses we outlined is what we call open finance. Um, that's also sometimes referred to as DeFi, which is kind of a, a buzzword right now if you're in the crypto community. Uh, open finance is really about uh, enabling either bilateral, trilateral, or multilateral contracts uh, between large numbers of parties to work where there is no middleman, there is no, there is no um, counterparty risk, where you have code that can arbitrate disputes and, and manage large scale contracts. Um, a simple example of that would be like a money market where you have lots of money going in and lots of money being um, you know, borrowed from, from that pool. Second major thesis that we, we invest along is what we call Web3, uh, which is really about um, enabling uh, increased access to, to data and um, about ma managing kind of data online. Um, a lot of these opportunities we're seeing today are around like increasing internet access um, in things like Helium and Arweave. Uh, and then the third major thesis is the opportunity for non-sovereign money or is what's more kind of colloquially known as digital gold which is really reflected by the Bitcoin thesis. Um, each okay, of these three thesis, uh, we believe is a ahead, trillion ahead, dollars and over the next each decade. Each of these theses is a trillion dollars, you're saying? It will be a multi-trillion dollar opportunity over the next decade. Um, and so okay. we spend our time really deep in the weeds, understanding those opportunities and making pretty concentrated bets along each of them. All right, I thank you for that. A, a, a broad view of the potential of blockchain, what with Web3 and trustless content, uh, contracts. But you know, um, respectfully, the age of the uh, decentralization zealot has been put on hold. And I, I've got to say a lot of our institutional investors, they like to hear that talk. It's all very exciting, but we're really trying to drill down on what are kind of investable opportunities like DeFi you mentioned? Uh, Jeff of Arca, would you, uh, Arca Funds, would you care to um, drill down a bit and let us know about some of the verticals that you find uh, particularly interesting besides just going long short on a basket of cryptocurrencies? Sure, thank you. And um, you know, first of all, I, I don't even use the word cryptocurrency very often. I use digital yes. assets. I think assets. I think cryptocurrency is one very important, but but albeit uh, actually kind of a small subsector of the digital asset space. So the way I, the way we think about this space is, you've got four basic types of digital assets to invest in. You have your money or your currency. You know, similar to what Kyle just said. You know, some of this is store of gold. There could be other uh, uh, reasons for currency. But these are, the, these are the types of digital assets that are meant to be money, whether that's Bitcoin, Litecoin, et cetera. Uh, and I think like most people on this panel, Bitcoin is far and away above everything else trying to be money. Then you have your protocols and your platforms. This is really what the 2017, 2018 uh, wave was, which was everybody trying to create a new, better blockchain, whether that was faster, more decentralized, whatever. Uh, we almost never invest in any of those. Um, I think it's much more of a venture capital type investment where it's you know, a winner take all, but you're going to have a lot more losers than you will winners. Um, that's not something that really accrues a lot of value in our opinion. Uh, but the third and fourth types of digital assets are much more interesting to us. And, and those are asset backed tokens, uh, you know, tokens that are actually backed by a real uh, asset, whether that's fixed income, equity, uh, or hard assets. Uh, there's not very many of those yet, but that's definitely coming. Um, you've even seen examples of uh, like an NBA player trying to tokenize his salary. That's a good example of an asset backed opportunity where there's a real valuation technique behind it. Uh, and then the fourth is probably the most uh, interesting to us, which is what we call pass through tokens. These are tokens that have very flexible mandates in terms of what, uh, what you're getting when you buy them. Uh, it can be part utility, it can be quasi equity, it can be an amortization feature, it can be a way to bootstrap a network, but these are tokens that actually accrue real economic value when you own them. Um, and we look at this space much like the fixed income market, which is you can no longer just say, I'm a fixed income investor, because the next question is, well, what does that mean? Are you invested in unis or govies or corporates? Are you invested in investment grade, high yield, distressed, you know, preferreds with warrants? It's a huge, unique ecosystem in fixed income, which you know, requires a page book, and by frankly, we understand any of the elements of fixed income. That's what the digital asset space is now. Each token is designed differently, and you need to understand them in a totally different way to invest. Thank you for that, Jeff, and uh, extremely interesting. Uh, 
but I believe the gauntlet has been thrown because if I heard you right, uh, you don't find uh, the, the venture side of blockchain interesting. And uh, Dan, you know, uh, on Pantera site, it says you focus on ventures and blockchain projects. Would you care to counter and uh, illuminate what is still interesting if, if indeed you still are interested in venture and blockchain projects and investing along those lines? Oh yeah, we invest in the whole blockchain space. So we invest in venture companies. We invest in very liquid blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin. And then we also invest in new projects that are being launched and, and are going to be new uh, tokens. Um, we see value in the whole spectrum. You know, there's, there's pros and cons that Bitcoin's incredibly liquid, uh, but you know, it's very volatile and the chance it goes up 100x from here is pretty small. Um, however, some of the venture projects we invest in or some of the young uh, token projects, they can go up 100x. So, you know, we want to offer that to our investors, the ability to get either really liquid things that have more certainty or illiquid things that, you know, could have more upside. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, um, we're kind of venturing to keep it one last question on the exposure to digital asset side, not, not about the hedge fund per se, is that as responsible investors, we should know what we're putting our money into. Um, you know, a lot of what funds and everyone's investing to in now are crypto derivatives, Bitcoin futures particularly, and that whole space can be quite opaque and illiquid. So um, for those of you who are weighted towards derivative trading, uh, shouldn't we wait until there's more adoption and transparency in the space if we're truly interested in diversification and risk management? Is Brian with us? Brian Kelly, would you like to feel that one? Hey, all, I'm here. I apologize for being a bit late there. No worries, Brian. Better so, late than never. Great to have you. Good to be here. Um, so listen, yeah, Bitcoin derivatives, Bitcoin futures have been a big part of the investing. And actually, you know, for institutional investors, that already are either a CTA uh, registered with the NFA or already have kind of the pipes into the futures and, and derivatives exchanges, it's a pretty easy way to get into the space. Um, you know, and, and you can continue to do that. And, and they're actually getting a lot more liquid than they have been in the past. Um, so you're, you're trading some serious volumes there. You can get in and out of stuff pretty easily. I mean, I remember, you know, when I started, I got into this in 2013, 2012, 2013. And, you know, if you did a $50,000 order, that was a big order, right? Now you could buy five or $10 million worth of Bitcoin with the push of a button. Um, so things have changed dramatically. Um, I think it's a way to, to kind of get you dip your, your toe in the pool and see what it's like and, and get that diversification. Uh, but I would agree with everybody else. There's, there's a lot more to this than just Bitcoin. I mean, what we're really investing in and what the way that we look at it is that you, know, you have a new economic structure here called the crypto economic network. And the token part of it needs to act like a currency, needs to have some kind of incentive for investors uh, to be involved in that. So that's what we look for. And there's a whole range of them. I mean, there's 10,000 cryptocurrencies now. Um, you know, probably 9,900 9, of them are going to go to zero. Uh, but the other 100 are pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, I like the way you frame that. Thank you, Brian. So uh, we'll wrap up the first phase then. Uh, thank you for those insights on the market itself, uh, different areas that we can be investing in. And uh, it's probably too early to summarize, but I do want to transition into uh, the panel specialty, which is the, the, the merits of um, active management and investing in a hedge fund as opposed to other strategies. So if I can move into the second phase of diversification, which has to do with choosing a fund. Um, you know, traditional hedge funds, I'm sure you're aware, are taking heat for underperforming compared to the market and ETFs. Uh, respectfully, many crypto hedge funds are returning less to investors, uh, obviously for, for obvious reasons, uh, than in the frothy 2016-17 crypto market. So uh, Desiree, you know, you just, you're well known. Swiss. SwissRex is well known for its very valuable research. People pay good money for it. And you talk about actively um, uh, analyzing and finding the best tokens to invest in. But, you know, again, I'm an institutional investor. Uh, it's all about diversification and risk management. Why would you recommend an investor uh, expose her portfolio to, to digital assets uh, to consider a fund first 
rather than say a cryptocurrency ETF. I could get into a couple of ETFs mirroring the trend in equities, you know, the top 10 currencies and ETF are up and coming. Uh, wouldn't I have a comparable diversification and there, uh, therefore a, a chance at a gradual upside? So uh, in my opinion, crypto is a very young and uh, inefficient market. And there are great opportunities to cr generate alpha by doing active management. I mean, compared to uh, equity markets, they are already very mature. We are more in the hedge fund industry 50 years ago. So there are great opportunities, of course, with certain risks. But uh, once uh, there are no more risks, uh, there will be much less upside. Um, and actually in Switzerland, we already have some uh, FINMA regulated banks, crypto banks and uh, brokers, which we can use, which uh, give us a very good infrastructure to do very safe trading and uh, storage of tokens. Excellent. Thank you for that. I'd like to jump in there too for a second, actually. You mentioned really quickly risk management and diversification as if they're similar. Uh, they're very different. R risk management is not only protection against downside prices and doing things uh, uh, you know, to protect against price movements, but also the service providers that you use, you know, the auditors, the accountants, everything involved in risk management is much bigger than just uh, price movements. And, and also on the diversification side too, um, with, with Indexes, indexes in equities or fixed income are great after you know 50 to 100 years of data and you know that it's actually representative of the universe. The indexes that exist today, if they're market weighted, they're pretty much just Bitcoin. You know, they're 85 to 90 percent Bitcoin. That is not representative of what the space is anymore. Uh, and even if they're equal weighted, it, it's largely just what we talked about earlier, which is cryptocurrencies, which is a very important but not an all encompassing area of the digital asset space. So diversification is great if it's actually representative of what you think it is. The indexes that exist today are not representative of this space. Uh, and again, risk management, I, I don't think diversification gets you to risk management. I think it's all the other things that an active manager does that helps you with risk management. That's a great point. Thank you for that. Yes, a good point about the, the risk management. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's trite to say. I realize that because it has so many aspects. But then maybe I can open things up by mentioning that, you know, a lot of the... Um, uh, at least the Asian investors that Lehman Bush is talking to, they're willing to expose uh, on average five to 10% of their portfolios to digital assets. They're ready to go, but you know, they, they worry about uh, regulations in America, the, 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 the legal environment. Uh, everybody's worried about platform hacks and, and custody. So um, maybe Dan, maybe you could lead us off by uh, telling us about what specific risk mitigation strategies you have in place to make investors comfortable with sizable allocations in terms of some kind of uh, stack, if you can describe it in, in a concise way, please. Yeah, you know, we started off in 2011 and it was the Wild West. There were no custodians. Uh, I had 250,000 Bitcoins in my head. Um, it was a pretty wild era. It's so different now. You have this Chicago Mercantile Exchange doing uh, custody. You have the New York Stock Exchange doing custody. And the regulatory issues, which were real four or five years ago, really, I think, are all behind us. Um, all the agencies in the U.S. have ruled. They've all been neutral to positive. Um, and so all those worries that we had that were valid four or five years ago, I really think, are behind us. And that's why you're seeing massive institutions. All the biggest endowments have exposure to crypto now. Uh, and they wouldn't do it if all of those I's weren't dotted and T's weren't crossed. So that era, the Wild West, you know, was fun and interesting, but that was a while ago. And now institutions are piling into the space because you have regulated custodians, because the uh, regulations are very clear. Um, you know, so there really aren't any major hurdles. So you're saying there's no um, even gray swan, let alone black swan, some kind of, I don't know, presidential demented swoop of the pen or SEC um, kind of rug slipping banana peel that could cause some major upset that, uh, that a, a sharp hedge fund uh, manager couldn't foresee and deal with easily? Yeah, I don't think so. Obviously it's a high vol market. The market goes up a thousand percent some years, it goes down 80% other years, but that's just yeah. really from t you know, trading mania. It's just, it's so, it's such a powerful uh, opportunity. People sometimes get ahead of themselves and then, you know, pessimism pops in. Um, the market's been averaging 209% compound annual growth for nine years. You know, that is going to have some, some wild days up and down. 
but I don't see any kind of institutional risk. Your, your example of a, say a president, you know, writing some crazy legislation, that's, that's the whole the point, point of Bitcoin. No, but it's censorship free, right? Like you can't mm -hmm. stop it. Uh, and so I think that is its kind of main feature is that you, you know, there's no single person on earth that could, could um, mm -hmm. slow the project down. And it's not to say we won't have bubbles and we won't have busts, but I think, you know, we've reached escape velocity. There's, you know, probably 50 million people using it. All the major endowments uh, own it, you know, so it's essentially not going away. All right, fair enough. Thank you for that. And, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen who are attending, uh, you know, these are, these are stars in the digital asset hedge fund field. I'm not going to use the C word right now, uh, uh, further to request. And uh, the point being that uh, maybe we can take kind of a left turn. Rather than explaining uh, why you're the ideal fund, um, maybe we could start with you, Lee, because you have an award-winning fund, Altana Wealth. Could you briefly outline who your ideal client would be? Who, who do you think is a potential match? Tell us, you know, if you, if you, are, uh, if you meet the requirements and have the dry powder, uh, we would also ask that you have this kind of uh, investment philosophy. Who's your ideal client, Lee, to work with, besides someone who doesn't call too often? Somebody who gives me money as an ideal client, I think is probably, it's the, uh, that's probably oh. the case. <laughs> I, I think, um, look, I think uh, Dan talked about it a little bit as well. What we've seen differently over the last two years is institutional money. And most of our money was high net worth. People who were traders mm -hmm. originally, uh, people who, uh, you know, who, who just thought, you know, I'll have a small, uh, small exposure and see how this goes. And then suddenly last year, I don't know what really caused it, maybe a lot of the factors that Dan mentioned, but, but um, suddenly institutions were like, we need to have half a percent. We need to have half a percent in our portfolio in this, which sounds yeah. tiny, but actually it's an enormous number right across these big institutions. And yeah. so for us, I guess, yes, an ideal investor is somebody uh, of that sort of background who wants to get bigger, wants to learn about it, can see, that um, digital assets, crypto, whatever you want to call it, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you, know, you know, exchange of currency is the future. And I, I always make the point, and I just want to just jump in with this. I always make the point that when you look at a disruptive technology, I always try and do it in reverse. And I say, if the incumbent was swapped for the, um, for the newcomer, what would it look like? So for example, say you wanted to set up uh, a bookstore company, but Amazon had been around for a hundred years. And you went to the bank and you said, well, give me a loan because I'm going to put some high street shops. I'm going to put a few books in them and, uh, you know, pay staff and, you know, I'm going to disrupt Amazon. You'd be laughed at, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, similarly, if I, if, if the swift bank transfer system didn't exist today, would you build it? I mean, would you build that system where when you pay for something on Amazon or your credit card, you have to move money to your, credit card company to your bank, your correspondent bank, my correspondent bank, et cetera, when you can do PayPal with one person in the middle. Well, we've now gone one step further and it's direct. So I think institutions have seen that this is, you know, this is not a new invention, you know, exchanging money, uh, exchanging uh, without anyone in the middle. It's not a new idea, but it's very clever and it's been around and it's made great returns and they feel they need to learn about it. And therefore to learn about it, you need to invest and probably invest in, multiple different strategies, be they tokens, be they crypto, uh, Bitcoin itself, be they VC. So I think my ideal client is an institution who wants to grow with the space. Grow with the space. Very good. Thanks for that. And uh, Brian, you know, um, you've got a more traditional site uh, for uh, a capital group in that um, you've got your homepage and then some disclaimers. So I think it would be uh, revealing to a lot of us who can't do our traditional website check. How, same question to you, sir. I mean, as a, as a bit of an insight into how you operate in your philosophy, who do you see as, a, as an ideal investor? Yeah, I mean, I think the ideal investor here is, is somebody who's, who can size this appropriately. I think that's the key to the space. Um, so as, as Dan mentioned, it's an incredibly volatile space. It is the most volatile asset out there. That's where the opportunity comes from. But at the same time, you need to be able to uh, size it appropriately. So let's call it one to 5% of your portfolio. And you know, the reason why that number works is if we're all right, and this is a 100x opportunity, 
that one to 5% is gonna add a lot to your portfolio, a lot of alpha to your portfolio. Uh, if we're wrong and it does not 100X, okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a one to 5% uh, loss. And I don't think this stuff is going to zero anymore. Uh, years ago, that probably was a chance, but at this point, we're well beyond that. Um, so I think you, know, you have to make sure that this fits into your portfolio in the right way. I wouldn't put 50% of an institutional portfolio in this at all, but a half a percent to a percent. Uh, and if you look back over the last several years, what's interesting about that is if you did that, you would really increase your sharp ratio. So your volatility doesn't go up that much, but your returns go up significantly. And that's an asset that I think any investor would want to have in their portfolio. Thanks so much for that, Brian. And, you know, you bring up these numbers and thanks for reminding us. I mean, you're diversifying. You're not uh, wholly not putting uh, more chips than are warranted. You're, you're doing your homework and, and allocating a, a reasonable amount of your portfolio. And I thought it was interesting because, yes, you bring up the 1% to 5%, and we're finding that our Asia investors are willing to go double that on average. But, uh, Jeff, you're known as a numbers wizard, and, you know, Brian has brought up that, hey, let's go 1% to 5%. Let's bring up this, uh, the, the markets are crazier than ever. You know, I believe Goldman Sachs has just kind of nailed their warning to the wall about a decade of, of low yields. Would you agree that one to 5% is the way to go for, let's talk about alternatives and uh, say I'm an Asian investor and I'm saying I'm ready to go 10% on digital assets. Uh, uh, are, are you gonna say, whoa, Nelly, you should be 50, 40 bonds and equities and uh, spread out that 10% with gold? Or what do you think in terms of, um, those kind of numbers, given the, uh, the, the, the kind of race to uncorrelated uh, uh, alternative assets. Sure. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm a very good asset manager. I'm a very good risk manager. Uh, my job is not to be a wealth manager and to help people understand their allocations. Um, you know, the institutional allocation world is very good at figuring out the right allocation mix when they understand mm -hmm. what the risk and reward of each opportunity is. What I will say is that I think this industry has come a long way from three or four years ago where it was just, we're going to buy Bitcoin for you and therefore you should put a small percentage of your net worth in here. Uh, as we said earlier, this is a huge and growing asset class with a lot of different opportunities now. And we try to set up our fund that anybody who wants to put 100% of their assets can. You know, we have a sleep at night fund. We are not you know, subject to the volatility of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. We are finding real assets with real value where if you want to put your entire portfolio in our fund, you could. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that anyone does that. Uh, everyone should, should run their own uh, analytics and their own um, you know, asset allocation models. But you know, again, we, our ideal investor is someone who believes in transformational technology and innovation, but isn't afraid to deviate from the herd. And if you believe in tokenization, there's a lot more to this than just money in cryptocurrencies. I, I believe digital assets will be the third part of uh, I believe digital assets will be the third part of the capital structure for many companies. And ultimately, you're going to have debt, equity, and digital assets in your uh, capital structure. And as a result, you know, the Starbucks of the world, the Amazons of the world, they're all going to have a digital asset at some point. And, you know, we have a three to five year uh, head start before the Aries and the Oak Trees and the Blackstones get involved in this space where we can create value. So if you believe in tokenization and you believe in value capture in something that very few people are focused on, and you believe that there's an active manager like myself who, or others in the room who are good risk managers, you know, put as much as you believe in uh, in a fund like ours and we'll manage it accordingly. Super. You know, I'm so tempted, Jeff, to follow up on your comment on being excellent at managing, managing volatility when, uh, you know, ARCA focuses on uh, capturing alpha and small and mid cap digital assets. But I, I would like first to give uh, Kyle a chance because you're also talking about this belief factor and it's a very um, good kind of, a dividing line or unifying line, isn't it? Because Kyle, I'd like to give you a chance to answer the question about your ideal investor the same way, because uh, here you are focused on, on seed stage projects and, and you go multiple rounds with, uh, of equity with smaller projects that you believe in. Uh, it, I think it would be fair to say you're the most kind of uh, visionary money manager on our panel. So it, it, how, does that belief factor, um, would you agree or expand on that and say, yes, you know, if you're looking for, you know, a short term alpha or growth, uh, forget it. We're, we're looking at more um, long term growth in the space. Um, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm flattered by the comment. I'm not sure I'd go, go that far. Uh, a lot of the folks on this panel here are pretty smart and have pretty good thoughts. Um, where we spend, uh, so, so our ideal investor is someone who wants to bet firmly on the crypto space for some minimum time horizon, let's say three years minimum. Um, mm. Uh, and they're willing to underwrite some volatility between here and there. I think that though is true for everyone here. Uh, having folks coming into another fund on a quarterly basis in crypto is just kind of, it's kind of counterproductive. Um, there's just a chance your first quarter is bad. Um, so on someone with that kind of time horizon, um, most of our investors today, we run about hundred million across two funds. And most of our investors today are uh, large family offices. Uh, we have a handful of institutions and endowments and a lar large number of kind of famous technology celebrities uh, out of Silicon Valley, guys like Andreessen and Fred Wilson and Musker Ventures and those types of folks. Uh, that, that comprises most of our LP base. Um, as we grow, our LP base is becoming more and more, let's say traditional, today it's skewing towards family offices and, and now some endowments are making their way in. Um, our, our view is that, yeah, if you have the reasonable time horizon, then you can kind of pick your, pick your fund strategy either venture or hedge fund, that we, we provide one, one strategy for each of those, but all based on kind of fundamental research and understanding. Um, the other really interesting thing in crypto is there's a lot of ways to make money having a fundamental worldview that's not a 10-year venture view. There's a lot of things in crypto that I believe will be, you know, say meaningfully higher in price 12 months from now, but I believe maybe six years from now may be much lower in price. Um, and like the crypto space is full of those kinds of opportunities. And because this, this space is liquid, um, there's tremendous opportunities for alpha there. One thing I've had to really reorient my head around over the last few years being in the space is that I shouldn't, given these assets are liquid, I don't need to force everything to the, to the venture tier of, I wanna be long this thesis for five to 10 years. Uh, but there's still a lot of opportunity, even on a fundamental basis on let's say a six to 24 month time horizon. Great, thank you for that. And uh, you know, you're talking about your long-term time horizon. Of course, we all have to think about that. Let's flip the script though. Uh, Desiree, you know, a lot of air has gone out of the souffle. A lot of the excitement has left the room uh, towards cryptocurrencies lately because we all talk about long-term, but at the end of the day, you know, we're, we, we follow trends. We're not immune to hype and market cycles. And uh, you know, when, when uh, uh, crypto failed to be, at least let's say Bitcoin failed to be inversely related to the stock market, you know, uh, a lot of people kind of uh, lost, I don't want to say lost interest, but they decided let's put things on hold for now. How are you seeing this kind of flatness in the price of Bitcoin? I cannot hear you. Ernie, are you still there? So then I guess I will just start answering his question, uh, which uh, probably began with the large drawdown we saw in March, in not only in the crypto space, but uh, in the entire asset space, including equities, gold, and all asset classes. And um, actually with our strategy, we have two alpha generators. One is the asset allocation. So we decide how much ex exposure we effectively want to have to the market. And the second alpha generator is the token selection. So as we saw markets overvalued by the end of February, we actually decided to cut our exposure in half, which, it, which uh, gave us great opportunities to buy back these tokens at very cheap prices when the market uh, uh, crashed in uh, March. And um, we were able to build up uh, our portfolio to 100% again. Of course, it was disappointing to see that Bitcoin was correlated with the other asset classes. But actually, this is always the case when uh, such a shock happens in the market. Everything is correlated first because everyone tries to fly it into cash. And um, there are a lot of margin calls. So people need to sell and get into cash first. But uh, in the medium term, we saw that Bitcoin actually uh, recovered quite uh, well and fast from the large drawdown, even faster than many other asset classes. And over the medium term, we actually see no correlation to other asset classes. 
With regards to the flat development of uh, Bitcoin in the last couple of weeks or months, um, we actually, uh, or oh, this is the second part of our alpha generation, the token selection. And um, we actually do not just look at Bitcoin itself, but uh, we look at the top 50 tokens and uh, model them with uh, our fundamental analysis. And uh, we actually create a basket of around 10 different tokens that we invest in on average. And the tokens we invested in were performing quite well. We actually doubled uh, our assets just because of the performance this year. I mean, we had a performance of 100% this year because of our exposure to altcoins, to alternative coins. Congrats, impressive, that's excellent. And uh, you know, you bring up your fundamental analysis and uh, that's kind of a buzzword in this space, Desiree, because uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys, I wish I had had you guys with me when I was arguing for uh, the fundamental approach to some blockchain companies, but you know, in the traditional space, um, a lot of people will just scoff when you say that you can do fundamental analysis of blockchain projects, given the lack of transparency, the lack of, uh, the lack of a, a, a track record, et cetera. Lee, I'm sure you run into these objections having come from the traditional world as well. How would you, um, how would you respond to that objection to, uh, to, to the many institutional investors who are perhaps not as uh, sharp as, as, as yourselves on the panel? Uh. I think I've had a lot of no's uh, from investors over the years. And I think once you get to a no, I think that it's very hard to persuade them. I think the reality is you've got to persuade them uh, at the early stages that they like the idea. You've got to persuade them that uh, they're going to be able to sell it further up the chain because often they're gatekeepers. Mm. You've got to make sure they understand um, the risks involved. But I think, you know, Brian said it very well earlier. I think it's the having a very small allocation to some of these strategies with 50% downside, but you know, several hundred percent upside is gonna enhance your portfolio. And I think once they can get their head around that, I think in some case, it's not they're not doing it because they want to improve uh, their, their returns, it's because they don't wanna be left behind their peer group. And that some of it is actually just drawn by that. And I think that's one of the big changes with last year. You know, with the, the likes of Yale and the likes of Paul Chu Jones, some of these more respectable groups, um, they've made it easier for people to get invested, but more importantly, made them fearful that if they're not invested and they underperform by five, six percent because they don't have a one percent exposure, they have to be in. But no, my experience is once there are no, uh, you need to just put in your diary three to six months later when Bitcoin's higher again. Uh, and crypto's hire again to just phone them back again and see what you can do. But no is a very hard to turn around. That, that's of great value to folks like myself. Thank you, Lee. That's always, uh, you know, uh, talking to institutional investors and let's say guiding them in their decisions. But uh, really, uh, maybe I mishandled the question. I wanted to dig into this fundamental because, um, you know, when somebody uh, from the more traditional side tells me fundamental analysis in the crypto space Peshaw or some similar um, sound effect. Uh, Desiree obviously is is uh, well versed and a believer in the fundamental side. You know, we're just talking. I'm talking fundamental versus technical. You've got investors that say, "Well, I hope this fund is mainly talking about Bitcoin futures and things that lend themselves to um, you know technical analysis as opposed to trying to fundamentally value blockchain companies." Uh, Brian, what, what do you tell, have you run to this question? What would you tell someone uh, with this kind of attitude? Yeah, so, you know, in terms of the fundamental analysis of crypto, ultimately what we're talking about is network effect. So you can kind of apply some of the same techniques that you might have to internet companies that you did in the 90s, where eyeballs or mm. Twitter or Facebook, what are your monthly active users? Um, you know, that is the exact same thing that you have here in the crypto space. You can look at addresses. We focus a lot on address growth. So, you know, if you start to see address growth, that's akin to seeing MAUs uh, going up for Twitter or for Facebook. And that is a, as fundamental as it gets right there. That's what everybody uses. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I think there is a way, uh, and we're all kind of learning, everybody on this panel is, is a pioneer in this space in terms of how you analyze this asset class. Um, but that being said, doesn't mean you can't use traditional techniques. Doesn't mean that we don't use that. 
Um, in terms of, you know, technicals, what's kind of interesting is that, you know, much like the foreign currency space, a lot of my background is in, is in spot foreign currency. Um, you know, these assets respond quite well and act quite well with the technical. So, you know, for us, we use kind of a blend of both, right? And ultimately my job is, you know, to make money for investors. And, you know, when I run, write the monthly letter and say we're up X percent, most people don't care if I did it with technicals or fundamentals. Uh, we do both. We kind of call ourselves a quanta, a quantum mental shop. Uh, but ultimately what matter, what matters is what works. And, and in this space, the combination of the two actually works quite well. Just jumping sure. back in, just jumping in back in, Ernie, I think just to answer the question again, yeah. um, I also make the point and, um, you know, the Argentinian peso, whatever is worth five, 600 billion air miles, uh, 750 billion, which by the way, just recently, uh, American Airlines and Delta have securitized bonds against their mileage program. And yet, you know, you say to people, do you think crypto is worth nothing, 5 billion, 10 billion? They say, no, it's worth something. It's worth, it's, it's, it's internationally used. It's used globally. It's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, do you think that's more important than air miles? Now, they might say, no. I say, well, do you think it's more valuable than the Argentinian peso in a country that's bankrupt? And they say, yeah, yeah, pretty sure that's the case, right? And then, you know, you start going through it. And there are a number of currencies in the world that are traded with less liquidity daily that are worth worthless fiat currencies, are bankrupted several times, that the, the actual value of them in, this, in circulation is much higher. So, you know, you start looking at a relative value. Big cryptocurrencies or digital assets, what do you want to call them? Yeah, they might be niche and they might end up being 5 billion for gamers only, but if they're going to be global and used by everybody, they're trillions. There is no middle number. There's no 165 billion number where that's the that's the value, right? I mean, I, when you put it in that of, perspective, you know. I'd say a lot of these answers, too, just to jump in here, and I apologize, Lee. A lot of these answers thus far have been focused no on cryptocurrencies themselves, right? The actual currencies, the ones that are trying to be money, uh, whether that's Bitcoin, Litecoin, et cetera. Again, there's an entire universe out there, which is digital tokens uh, issued by real companies. And some of these tokens have properties with real cash flows and real yields. Um, and, and you can analyze these in the same way you do traditional in, in, instruments. So there is a whole universe of, of assets out there that can be modeled. I mean, I have a, a, a member on my team who has 15 years of experience at KPMG doing international M&A modeling, uh, and he has a JD and a CFA. And he's far more valuable to my team than anybody with a technology background or a, or, or a venture background looking at the future, because we are really looking and modeling the, the value of these, of these companies and the tokens that they're issuing in their capital structures. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about is, you know, equity is obviously a claim on future cash flows and debt is a claim on asset value. Both of those are very susceptible to a recession. If, if there's less spending, there's going to be lower revenues and there's going to be lower pro uh, profits and there's going to be lower uh, asset value. But digital assets are a claim on future network growth and future participation in a company. Uh, just like airline miles where Lee mentioned, those don't go down in value. Those still exist. So you can argue that this asset class is actually more recession proof than anything else if you find the right companies that have tokens that actually accrue economic value. Fantastic just insight. Jump in. Can I yep. jump in here, guys? Just that, given the area that we're on, I've obviously got questions that were submitted by the attendees when they registered for the event. And one such question, I think, fits well uh, of where we're at with this discussion. And it is how do we calculate fair value and find value? in this asset class, whether it be in digital assets or cryptocurrencies or early stage tech companies. Uh, and I just find that's, that's kind of fitting with where we are now. So does anyone want to just, I'll put that out to the audience. Does anybody want to, to take that one on board? So how do we find fair value either in digital assets or in early stage tech companies? Uh, I'll start off with that one. So there's different styles of assets. I think Jeff alluded to kind of three or four different types of assets. Um, for the simplicity of answering this question, you can just think of some assets as capital assets versus cash assets. Um, no one tries to value dollars against euros um, because they're not valued against each other. They're priced against each other. And obviously there's a lot of people who trade, you know, euro dollar curves and whatever, like all these things. But no one actually thinks there's like a fundamental value model between euros and dollars because there's no exogenous cash flows out of euros that produce dollars. Um, so, so Bitcoin and a, and a large number of other assets in the space kind of fall into that broad bucket. There are interesting ways to do relative value models and stuff in that space, but there's no absolute fundamental value in those types of tokens. Uh, but as, as Jeff was just alluding to, there's a lot of tokens that actually do uh, have that. So one example would be an asset called uh, Arweave. 
Uh, our is kind of like, think about it as Airbnb for your hard drive, or you can like rent out hard drive space and get, get paid for doing so. Um, in that system, you can actually model very clearly demand coming into the network, how much stuff do people want to store, and that's completely transparent and audible in real time. Um, and you can see what the cost of storage is. Um, and then you can see there's some kind of clever cash flow mechanics and like how cash flow flows in the system. And you can actually measure it in a very direct way, uh, like how many net new dollars are flowing into the ROE asset. Um, and you can project that with some reasonable level of precision. That the exact growth curve is always hard for these things. Um, and they can kind of step function change pretty quickly. But um, like those kinds of opportunities are, are very much out there. Um, and actually the even better part is a lot of the information is public, but not easily observable. So like if you go into the Arweave Discord, which is like a public chat room with the Arweave developers, like do they say, hey, these are the 10 people are gonna come online next week and start adding data to the network? Like no, but you can just go on there and ask them and say, hey guys, like, are there net new interest developers who are gonna start putting stuff in this thing soon? And there's a good chance they're just going to answer your question. Um, and like that's, and that's a public form, completely public form. Uh, but like, is that in a K1 registration or, or some other disclosure document? No, but it is public. Um, and so there's all of these kinds of interesting opportunities, both to find alpha and to be able to measure with some precision what fundamental value is um, that, that are really like, that's the bread and butter for, for folks like us. I suspect Jeff spent a lot of his time on stuff like that as well, uh, as do the other folks on the panel. Thanks, Kyle. And, and but yes, uh, Jeff, you alluded to that as a universe. And um, from where we're sitting anyways, this is still quite nascent and hasn't attracted a lot of attention. But you do see that that having said that, yes, now we realize there is a, a, a good swath of digital assets that bear up to fundamental analysis very well. Is that a significant portion of the of the ecosystem right now? Or are we waiting for that to uh, to happen? I mean, from, from a market cap standpoint, obviously it's small, right? Bitcoin is, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum alone make up what roughly 70, 80% or 80 of the market cap. So, uh, you know, most, so mo I mean, most of this universe right now is in the small to mid cap uh, realm. So you definitely, uh, you know, you need an active manager who is the dedicated time to do research on this space. Um, you know, I, I think of it a lot of times as if anybody in the room has ever invested in a healthcare fund, most people who invest in healthcare don't really understand how hospital readmission rates work or how Medicare reimbursement works or how phase three drug trials work. They just believe that healthcare has a space in their portfolio and then they go find a manager uh, or a representative uh, a fund that is going to give them exposure to that space. And I think that's what most investors need to do in the digital asset space right now is recognize that there is a need for this in your portfolio, that it's a real asset class that isn't going away and it has characteristics that are different than your traditional real estate fixed income equity buckets. Uh, and then you need to find somebody who has a strategy um, uh, of, and a uh, investable universe that matches what you believe in and let them do what they're good at, which is finding this value. There is tremendous value in the space if you're looking for it. And it has evolved quite a bit over the last two years. And you need a strategy uh, and a manager that is evolving with the space. Um, you know, Bitcoin is a great investment. I love Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a small allocation in our portfolio. But if you believe that Bitcoin is the entire space, uh, it's just not true anymore. Excellent. Well, well, you, you certainly capped off uh, the, the second phase of diversification, which is the argument for uh, investing in a digital asset hedge fund. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in attendance, I think you'll agree that if you were to try to undertake research and investment on your own part, uh, whether it's in this, whether it's in this um, uh, sector, the universe that, 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 that Jeff and Kyle just spoke to so eloquently that bear, and Desiree that bears up to fundamental analysis, or whether you're using algorithms um, to do uh, technical trading in Bitcoin futures, uh, active management is a very good idea. And uh, it does kind of fit that diversification mandate. So here's basically the last question, and I don't know how long it'll go, but uh, you know, the, the hope with um, Block Asset Management and Lehman Bush as we were kind of leading you into having to admit. Um, and Dan, uh, I'll, 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 I'll beg the question, because at a recent uh, Bloomberg Digital Asset panel, uh, you mentioned that uh, it makes sense to uh, spread out your allocation across a lot of products, or maybe you may have said even across a lot of managers. So there it is, guys. I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, you should know the Block Asset Management invests in all of these great funds. We can't pick just one. Uh, Dan, would you, would, do you agree that it makes sense for triple diversification as we've laid it out tonight to invest in a fund of funds, or are you gonna make the argument for one fund above all. 
No, I do. And, and we've actually lived this. Um, yeah. There was a time we were the only fund in the asset management space, and we only offered one product, and that fund only had one asset in it. So mm -hmm. the entire Bitcoin fund was the only thing out there. And we went around to Yale and Stanford and everybody, and we mm -hmm. pitched that, <clears throat> and it didn't work. Nobody wanted it because there was no diversification. And I think that is one of the big reasons that institutions are now allocating to the space because there are, you know, a half a dozen, um, you know, uh, very reputable firms. Each of those firms has two or three funds and each of those funds has 30 different assets. So an allocator can actually build a portfolio that's diverse both in terms of asset uh, types, but, you know, managers, you know, all those kind of idiosyncratic risks. And so I, I do think it's very prudent for uh, an investor to begin with some kind of diversified fund of funds type approach. And then, yes, you know, if they become an expert in the space, maybe they want to start doing more single manager stuff. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, Brian, care to comment? Again, the, our, our simple thesis is triple diversification. Get into crypto assets because you need to expose your, your, your portfolio to that asset class if you're at all uh, interested in growing with the space, keeping up with the times. Get your, uh, por that section of your portfolio actively managed. What do you say, Brian? Uh, fund of funds is a great way to expose yourself to fantastic funds like yourselves. Yeah, I, it, so I think fund of funds have gotten a bad rap uh, in the traditional world because people say they're laying fees on top of fees. Uh, I actually think the crypto space is the one space where fund of funds makes all the sense in the world. Um, you're talking about a new asset class. It's incredibly difficult to travel around the world, and I know you guys have done this, and visit every asset manager. There's only a handful out there. And each of us invests in different types of assets, right? So you run the gamut from you know, our fund, which is uh, in the top 20 or so. We tend to look more like a uh, long, short fund, uh, whereas you might have something like a venture fund. Um, and then you can get exposure across that asset class. So not only can you reduce by investing in the space, you can reduce your kind of, uh, your, you, can, you can add to your alpha, but by using a fund of funds or investing across funds, you can actually kind of mitigate some of the risk in this space. And you know, you're gonna have years, as Dan said earlier, you're gonna have years where this asset goes down 50, 70%. It's new, this is just what they do. That's the opportunity. Uh, but in those years, if you're invested in, let's say, a fund to fund or you're invested across funds uh, and maybe the venture funds are actually doing well that year. So it gives you diversity there, uh, diversification there. Thank you. I'm so glad we're recording this. You know, I'm going to be studying this because uh, thanks for making my case so eloquently, Brian. But, you know, uh, let's let's do some high school debate team. Who wants to who wants to. Um, speak against fund of funds. We'd like to hear the opposing viewpoint. I, I, I have the feeling maybe Desiree or, or Lee, you have some insights about, uh, you know, choose, uh, do your homework, find a fund manager that you really share the vision with and have a good relationship and go with them. Uh, does anyone want to comment? Uh, Lee, Desiree? I mean, I, I think it really depends on the portfolio manager skills in the end. It's uh, the sure. same as with a fund like ours. You guys also have to choose the portfolios you want to invest in. You need to know what their strengths and weaknesses are, in which an environment they work very well and in which ones they don't. And uh, potentially you also have to actively manage this. So I think in the end, it all comes down to the skills of the portfolio manager again. But I also think that founder funds take out some volatility and uh, they are a certain hedge in uh, difficult times, as was mentioned just before. Thank you for that. Uh, if anyone else wants to weigh in for yeah, their- Yeah, I, I, I don't totally agree with Desiree there. I think that's, uh, that's, that's not completely true. I think uh, the portfolio skills are obviously important, but you've also got to do a lot of due diligence in any fund of funds business. Um, the people maintain that they're still doing the same, doing the right things. Uh, they need to make sure they've got the right custodians, the right infrastructure. You've got to keep on top of that every quarter, maybe every six months, as Brian said, travel around the world. So some of what a fund of funds does in any sector is mundane, boring, and a service. And you pay for that. There's a fee for that. And then on top of that, there's some portfolio allocation skills. And in some cases, that, is, that outweighs, that is the most important factor. But the other point here is we're talking about big institutions with maybe even $10 billion. 
allocating 100 million to crypto and therefore having to do all that work and have to put a team on it and distract from their 30 or 40 percent they have in credit or fixed income i mean it just doesn't make any economic sense to do all that due diligence work and the portfolio allocation work everything else for the, the savings they would make uh doing it in-house versus going to a fund of funds so you know i think there's there's two sides to it fund of funds do get a bad rap they do provide a very important service which is doing the check or should be doing a very important service doing the checks on the companies individuals talking to their auditors talking to their counterparties talking to their peers but also you know maybe some asset allocation and uh, i think in this particular sector asset allocation is very difficult to prove that you have pedigree very difficult to uh, to show that uh, you have an edge because the track records are short so you know the key issue here is i think a large proportion of the fee is actually finding the managers and making sure they are reputable and have all the right processes in place processes thank you I'd, I'd like to put a a bow on that and and thank you all for for just uh talk about delivering i think you'll agree ladies and gentlemen i i've learned so much tonight great points thank goodness we've recorded this and uh, i'd love to go on but we did tell most of our audience that we'd go an hour and uh as you can imagine uh our, our panel uh have a have a lot of things in their day besides uh this webinar so i think what we'd like to do at this point is um uh, Kevin is going to take over the Q&A, and uh, I imagine you must have some questions out there in the audience. So having gotten this very gentle and um, uh, nice uh, handoff for the Fund of Funds, uh, Kevin, would you, would you care to tell uh, quickly, please, about Block Asset Management's UVP, and then we'll move right into Q&A? Of course I will, and some very, very valid comments all around there. Um, what I'll say is that in 2017, uh, the management started our due diligence process analyzing the digital assets universe in order to find the best managers and the most investable funds within the space so that we could launch at that time the world's first digital assets and blockchain focused fund funds which was back in January 2018. Now we have almost 900 funds in our database at present so you can imagine the ongoing task um, that is carrying out this due diligence, as, as Lee rightly mentioned, uh, and it's, it's lengthy due diligence that we, the, the team, undertake. Um, and you know, for the audience there, we can confirm that, and as, as you have mentioned, um, Ernie, we do allocate to the six exceptional managers that are on the call today. And again, hitting the nail on the head there, Lee, is that you have to do the amount of due diligence to acquire the right funds in, in, in making sure that each fund has the right counterparties, has the right auditor, custodian, um, strategy, managers, experience. So that's what we do. So block asset management are in essence a, a giant risk filter, we believe, um, in selecting the right funds within this universe um, and therefore giving exposure to the digital asset space via the best managers and therefore reducing both risk and volatility. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. So I agree with, with everything said there, you know, um, they're all very valid comments. Thanks, Kevin. And we're going to move into Q&A. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, uh, I, I think you can appreciate what a, a rare and great opportunity this is. We've got these superstars. Good luck getting Brian or Lee or Dan on the phone or something with your questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear what you've got. And, and for the many uh, fund managers out there on the list, we know you're out there. Go ahead and uh, Take a shot at the champs. Let's let's hear some good questions. I'll start from one that I can see on the panel because I've been flicking through that as we uh, as we've been talking. So I can see somebody here, uh, Alberto, has put on here to all panelists. How do you believe CBDC is going to affect Bitcoin? So it's an interesting question. Anyone want to take that one forward? I'm ha I'm happy to jump in on that. So the, uh, the central bank digital currencies for those that are unfamiliar sure. with CBDC. Um, I don't think they're I don't think they're a threat to Bitcoin at all. I mean, the to Bitcoin and and a lot of these other currencies, you're talking about you have you have the ability to opt into a particular monetary policy. And so, with Bitcoin, similar to gold, the monetary policy is fixed supply. We're not going to print any more money. So, whether or not a dollar or a yuan or a yen 
uh, is digital or not, we effectively have that already. They're already digital. Um, what you're investing in or what you're putting your money into there is the monetary policy of the country. And what we're seeing, obviously, globally, is they're just printing a lot more money. So I think it's interesting. I think it's good for the space that central banks are in it, that the technology is validated, uh, that, the, that this kind of new technology is saying, hey, this is good enough for central banks. It's got to be good enough for everybody else. But I don't think it's a threat to Bitcoin or any of the other currencies uh, that we all invest in. Uh, I'll go oh. maybe a couple, couple steps further, actually, to add to that, which is, you know, at some point, every investment committee over, let's say, some period between call 1996 and 2005 had to sit down and say, okay, like, what is the internet? And like, what, what is information, like, what is moving information around mean? Like, what are the impacts for society? You started to do things like Google, and that started to kind of like make this more real. Um, and I think what central bank digital currencies do is they force every investment committee on the planet to sit down at some point and say, wait a minute, like, just to rethink how does the current financial system work? You've got central banks and then commercial banks and then how, how money kind of flows through the system. Um, and if you sit down and then you're forced to rethink about it and there's some new model from the central bank, it just forces you to also look at the kind of adjacent thing, which is you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Libra, whatever. Um, and so in that sense, central bank digital currencies are good because it just creates new attention to go look at crypto things that would otherwise not dedicate its attention towards the asset class. Very, another question that was pre-submitted and one that I've been asked several times myself, during the recent COVID-19 led crash, um, the crypto market also fell in line with traditional markets when obviously it's supposed to be an uncorrelated market. Can anyone in the panelists sort of give their explanations to why there seemed to be a, a coupling between uh, the digital asset space and the traditional markets? Kevin, I'll do that if you like. Um, Bitcoin is, uncorrelated with all assets with the exception of very, very steep spikes in down risk scenarios. And so there have been five since Bitcoin has been frequently traded. And in each of those, Bitcoin's been highly correlated for an average of 31 days. And then over 73 days, that correlation fades back to its essential zero. And that's actually what's happened here is in the early part of March, Bitcoin was highly correlated with the S&P. Uh, and now it's not. And I think uh, Ernie's earlier point, is, I want to stress to participants is, you should have some money invested in an industry where you're complaining that it's only up 30 to 100% during a once in a century pandemic and financial crisis, right? All other assets are down. Um, most hedge funds haven't really made money for years. Ernie's asking, hey, why isn't Bitcoin up more? Bitcoin's up 30%, Ethereum's up 90, our funds are up 60 or 70, and people are saying, hey, why isn't it even more? That's the, big, the biggest uh, advertisement for why you should have some assets in this space. I'd also just to quickly say, there's a very big difference between flight to quality and safe haven, right? A safe haven literally means refuge from something, right? And in, in the Bitcoin's case specifically, this is a refuge from a collapsing fiat currency policy and, and, and monetary policy, uh, and potentially like, you know, your own government collapse in certain areas of the world. Flight to quality means you're moving into it quickly to preserve cash in some sort of a you know downdraft or some sort of a, a crisis type mode. So just because Bitcoin did not act as a flight to quality uh, during a very highly correlated period of all risk assets doesn't take away the fact that it can still be a safe haven uh, for people looking to get their money out of an existing system that has been failing them. Okay, another question that's been submitted here, we can see uh, on screen is, uh, do you see the digital assets industry moving towards tokenizing their funds? What are the advantages or limitations in your point of view? Yes, we definitely see that. And uh, we actually would love to tokenize our fund too. The issue currently is that regulation is not there yet. So um, it's not possible to trade these security tokens on exchanges yet. And if it's not tradable, it's not a big advantage for us. But um, I'm sure this is going to come in the next uh, few, in the early future. Anybody else? Maybe one thing to add. What I would appreciate more about the tokenized fund is uh, daily liquidity. It would be much cheaper um, to, to handle such a portfolio as a token. And um, yeah, I would appreciate that a lot. Thank you very much, Desiree. I'm conscious we're 10 minutes over, so I'll just go with one more question, which is again pre-submitted, which would be, 
what could drive, what factors could drive demand and adoption in 2020 and beyond? So again, I'll just open it up to the audience, guys. I think we might all have an opinion on this. Maybe one more thing to add to this question. So mm -hmm. I think actually Corona was the ideal environment for our fund strategies or for the crypto space overall, because people start questioning a lot of things, a lot of the existing infrastructure, uh, banks and governments, and uh, I actually also think, especially here in Switzerland or in Europe with the negative interest rate environment and um, really the question, where do you want to invest when equities have already had a huge performance and real estate as well? So how do you diversify your portfolio? Where the, do you get the return from? I think uh, people really start thinking of uh, diversifying into crypto also after the drawdown we had and uh, they saw that crypto survived and actually behaved quite stable afterwards. So I think this environment helped a lot, helped a lot to make people aware of the opportunities in the crypto space. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add to that, that this is the exact environment that crypto and Bitcoin was developed for. If you remember, you know, it was 2009, right after the crisis that we, that this was released and it was because people were concerned about the traditional financial system. And so here we now have the response to COVID-19, which is every central bank expanding money supply, which is exactly the time that, you know, as an investor, you want to buy things that have a fixed supply. So real estate, there's only so many houses out there. There's only so many buildings, uh, gold, gold and silver, you're seeing those do quite well. And then crypto. Um, and so I think in this environment, this is, this is the place to be, in my view. You know, if you're just looking at a pure portfolio wise, how do you want to invest in an environment where every central bank is printing money? Uh, you want to invest in fixed, fixed supply assets and that's what crypto represents. When Satoshi created Bitcoin, he put the quote from the uh, Times of London in there about being pissed off that the chancellor had just done 50 billion pound stimulus plan. The United States, had a deficit last month of one trillion dollars, which is just Satoshi, like that's just orders of magnitude bigger than he or she or it was worried about. And that is equivalent to the first 204 years worth of money printing in the United States. So it's time to own something that has a fixed quantity like silver or Bitcoin. I think, I think the answer I would give to this question, Ernie, is that to what would derive demand drive it up? I think is real usage of the blockchain. And we're seeing a little bit more of that in the shipping space. We're seeing it in a few other spaces in uh, trade finance. I think what we'd really need is to see an acceleration of the adoption of, uh, of transactions on the blockchain that are not trading related, that are, that are real world related. And I think if that were to happen, I think you would see a bit like the air miles industry, you'll see another, another exponential growth phase in, in the crypto space. Julie. That's the question to my side then, guys. We have time to extend, Kevin? Uh, if you feel if you feel necessary, yeah, I'm, I'm out questions, my side. Yeah, I mean, um, granted the, the time limitations that we promised are uh, a very busy panel, uh, and, unless someone is um, coming in now, I, why, why don't we wrap things up because Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for being with us. And do remember these names, Dan Moorhead of Pantera and Desiree Muller of Swissrex AG, Jeff Dorman of Arca Funds, and uh, Lee Robinson, Altana Wealth Fund, Kyle Samani of Multicoin. Uh, don't forget that Block Asset Management is invested in all of them. And we've talked about triple diversification tonight. But if you're interested in any of these funds, any more information, uh, or introductions, that's what we're here for. And we're gonna be sending you the presentation link and more info. And um, yeah, I just, uh, th there should be some thunderous applause at this time I feel for our, for our distinguished panelists. Uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and your great insights. It really, it means a lot to us and uh, we thank you deeply. <laughs>